Welcome to The Crossing Church. This is the version of The Crossing that goes where you go and delivers what you need. Fresh perspectives on faith and Jesus with practical, real-life next steps built in. This is your place to explore faith and experience the life-changing ways of Jesus. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Now this is part of Psalm 23. Have you heard it before? Even if you've never read the Bible, many of us have heard these words on a TV show or at a funeral or in a hospital. These ancient words comfort something in us. And in those moments when we feel like life is fragile or dangerous, these are words that people have reached for over thousands of years. They bring temporary peace in the midst of life's storms. But what if that peace wasn't temporary? What if we could learn to believe this psalm, these words, as more than a balm for our souls, but really as a reality to live in, a river of strength that brings permanent peace? What if these words weren't just beautiful poetry, but a vivid reality? Not just something to hope for in the future, but a way to live here and now through all of life's circumstances. Now, my name is Nicole. I get to be one of the pastors here at The Crossing. Welcome to our Full Spectrum series where we are studying the book of Psalms. Now, one of my favorite authors and Bible scholars, Dallas Willard, who wrote a book called Life Without Lack that helped inform a lot of this sermon today, he said, Unfortunately, the Lord is my shepherd is a sentiment carved into tombstones more often than a reality written on lives. Because while many of us are familiar with Psalm 23, while we may read it as a comfort when death looms, we don't live like it's true. In our time together, my hope is that you would really start to believe this psalm for your whole life, that it could be lived out fearlessly and joyfully, not just read in the darkest times, that you would have a life of peace where you can say, I lack nothing. That first line of Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Let's be honest. It feels like wishful thinking, right? Even if you've read those words thousands of times, do you actually live like they are true? Do you live as if you lack nothing? Probably not, right? I don't. I know that I live like I lack a lot of things. I lack comfort or money or love. I live like I need more of those things. We can try to imagine it, a life without lack, but it's really hard to imagine, right? It doesn't seem possible when everyone we know is living a life where they lack something. People, humans, need to see what is possible in order to grow beyond what they know. That's why representation matters, why seeing possibilities matters. You can't be what you can't see. What do kids always want to be? Kids want to be teachers and firemen and athletes and vets because those are the only jobs they see, right? We only know to want what we see as possible. We have to see it to believe it is possible for us. You can't be what you can't see. Now, have you ever heard the story of Roger Bannister? He is the man who, on May 6th, 1954, he broke the four-minute mile barrier with a time of 3.59.4. It's amazing. Gifted athletes, smart coaches, they had been training and trying to break that four-minute barrier since 1886. No one could do it, and people were pretty convinced that it wasn't possible. But still, people were trying, and there was media coverage even. And as the runners tried, journalist John Bryant, he said, it had become as much a psychological barrier as a physical one. And like an unconquerable mountain, the closer it was approached, the more daunting it seemed. The experts believed they knew the exact conditions needed to break four minutes. The athletes would have to train two to three hours a day to prepare. The actual race would have to be so specific. Perfect weather, 68 degrees, no wind, perfect track, hard, dry, clay, perfect crowd, huge and excited to cheer that runner on, right, to his like historic performance. 
But Roger Bannister, he actually didn't follow any of those perfect guidelines. His schedule was super full, so he could only practice about 30 to 45 minutes a day. And on the day he broke the time barrier, it was a cold day on a wet track at a small meet in Oxford, England. Under imperfect circumstances and imperfect training, supposedly, he showed that it was possible. And when he broke that four-minute barrier, even his biggest rivals were excited. At least someone had done it, right? It was possible. After that, it was like people's mindsets totally opened up. Only 46 days after Bannister's win, a man named John Landy, an Australian runner, he ran a mile in 3.58. And then a year later, three runners broke that four minutes in a single race. As it goes for those runners, it goes for us in our lives. It starts by seeing what is possible. You can't be what you can't see. That's what this book, that is what the Bible opens up in our lives by showing us what is possible. The Bible was written by real people learning to train, to run their spiritual races. It tells stories of people running their race, living their lives, the kind of lives we've all been told are impossible. It's impossible to live with peace every day. It's impossible to live without lack. Finding contentment and real love, that way of living seems impossible. But the Bible says it's not impossible. The Bible shows us the records, people who have done it, which means you can do it, I can do it. There's this book called Hebrews where in chapter 11, it just lists all these people who have lived by faith. 16 men and women are mentioned by name as heroes of the faith. People like Abel and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Sarah and Joseph and Moses and Rahab and Gideon, Samson and David, listing all these people, showing us that it can be done. Then in verse 1 of chapter 12, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Okay, therefore, since we can see these witnesses, these heroes of the faith, we can see that it's possible, let us throw off everything that's holding us back. Throw off the beliefs or habits or sins, the mindset that entangles us, and let's Run with perseverance, the race marked out for each one of us. We are living in the wake of Roger Bannister's barrier-breaking run. People can break four miles now. We are living in the wake of the heroes of the faith. We can live a life of no lack. There is so much more possible in our lives than we've been told. We just have to see it. So let's try on this way of living without lack, living a life of deeper faith. Let's read Psalm 23 as if it's possible, as if it's an account of someone breaking a barrier of human possibility. Now, you can go to Psalm 23. If you have a Bible, you can use our app. It's the Crossing CM to take notes, read along. Now, Psalm 23, this Psalm of David, it calls itself. Well, David is listed as one of the heroes of the faith. David was a man who lived through all kinds of imperfect situations and hardships. He spent years unseen and unappreciated by his family. He spent years in hiding, running for his life, hungry and scared. He spent years as a leader, making all kinds of decisions and horrible mistakes. And yet he broke the barriers of lack and fear Psalm 23 says that no matter what your circumstances, this kind of life is possible. So let's read the whole thing together, get a clear picture of the life that it's hard to imagine on our own, and talk about how to make it possible in your life and mine. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Someone lived like this. We can live like this. For one day, let's just say, 
yes, and see what happens. It starts with our mindset, what we think is possible. Our ultimate freedom is to choose what we think, what we remember, what we believe. Your primary contact with God is through your invisible inner self, right? And having a trustworthy picture of the nature of God in your mind or heart is what makes it possible to have a breakthrough. So today, let's open our minds to the possibility that there is a loving God who is actively involved in the lives of people who know and trust Him. Those people who can actually say, I lack nothing. Now, we often jump to the assignment of lacking nothing, right? Without realizing why we can say that. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Why would anyone lack nothing? Only because the Lord is their shepherd. A couple weeks ago, Andrew read a psalm where God was called Elohim, which is more of a title than a name. It means the mighty one, the judge, the ruler. It carries the idea of majesty and reverence. But in Psalm 23, we see the word Lord, and it is a different word for God. It's not Elohim. It is Yahweh. Whenever you see Lord written with these four uppercase letters, it is Yahweh, which is not a title. It is more personal. It's a name, God's name. It means I exist. I am. This God is. Yahweh is the name of God when he is interacting with his people, saving them, helping them, just with them. Yahweh, the one who is with us. Now, as Dallas Willard says, we are blessed to live in a world where there is a fully self-sufficient, generous God who wants to provide what is best for us and loves us more than we could ever imagine. That's Yahweh. That's our shepherd. Can you imagine it? This is who can be our shepherd if we choose it. Now, we've all had shepherds in our lives. We call them parents or coaches or teachers or pastors, and all those shepherds were imperfect. They loved us, but they hurt us. They couldn't see the fullness of who we are because they were finite humans still working on themselves. So we grow up lacking. And then we try to be our own shepherd, independent, leading ourselves. But that eventually doesn't work either. We still feel the lack. But this shepherd, this Yahweh, has always been self-sufficient, whole, able to love completely and perfectly, able to provide for us and care for us. Psalm 27 says it this way, Even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord holds me close. How does that change things? How does that get us to the place where we can say, I lack nothing? Well, have you ever noticed that often we don't need a friend to fix a situation for us? We just sometimes need someone to listen, to care, to witness our lives or our pain. It is the constant, perfect witness and presence of the Lord that heals our lack. We can choose in our minds to believe in a being who is generous and present, able to be with us and really see us with love all the time. Have you ever heard the therapy term empathetic witness? Okay, so here's kind of a definition. So we know both these words, empathetic, the ability to understand another person's thoughts, right, and feelings in a situation from their point of view rather than your own. And then witness. It's one asked to be present at a moment so as to be able to testify to its having taken place. That is an empathetic witness. God is our ultimate empathetic witness. Through that, we are slowly healed from the lack in our lives. Now, we use the word trauma a lot, a lot more now than we used to, but maybe we haven't really heard a true, good, helpful definition of it. I find it's helpful to understand the value of our perfect, loving God as our empathetic witness if we understand what trauma is. So there's this doctor and trauma specialist. His name is Gabor Mate. He defines trauma as, see, trauma is not just what happens to us, but what we hold inside in the absence of an empathetic witness. Trauma is where we lack, where we hurt. It's not really what happens to us. 
It's what we hold inside after something happens, what we hold inside in the absence of an empathetic witness. We need to be witnessed when we experience pain. We need to be seen and held and cared for. Our human shepherds were not capable of truly being an empathetic witness, and we lack because of it. We have trauma because of it. But when we imagine our God who loves us completely, constantly, we realize that we are never without an empathetic witness. We are never without someone who understands what we are going through. And that is why we can say, I lack nothing. For me, this was a game changer in my faith, actually believing that God cared about my experience. It feels absurd at first. In the moments where I felt invisible or like the people around me didn't see me or my pain, learning that God was always present and actually wanted to hear from me, to have that empathetic witness who wasn't bothered by me. I never had to wonder if I was annoying God or being misunderstood. The Lord is my shepherd. He likes that job. I like to think it's his favorite. I lack nothing because how can you lack anything when you are surrounded by perfect love that actually likes you too? So then we see this picture, this barrier breaking picture of a life without lack. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. A sheep who is lying down in green pastures is a sheep who is not hungry. A sheep walking beside quiet waters is not thirsty. A resting sheep has everything it needs. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Ooh, he refreshes my soul. The broken depths of me are healed as I follow my shepherd. We grow closer, so close and so loved that I can even then say, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. Even when we are in the darkest valleys, the hardest times, one friend called it the dimmest basement of life, we can fear no evil. When we are misunderstood, when no one thinks we are a success, when illness comes, when we lose things we love, we can fear no evil. And here's why. And we should probably say this one out loud together. For you are with me. It is only because of God's presence and my choosing to follow him as my shepherd that this is possible. But also, notice. I don't know if you noticed this. Up until now, I want us to look back. It said, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When we are in the darkness, when it's the hardest times, we stop saying he. We stop describing how God is with us, and we start looking right at him. You are with me. Eyes on God. He's right there. So recently, my husband and I went on a multi-day hike where we were going across miles and miles of trails that were really tricky to navigate. There was a lot of climbing and jumping, ladders and walking across logs and rocks, all kinds of things. It was dangerous. Now, my husband runs on trails way more than me. He's an expert. So most of the time, he was in front. He was checking the ladders and logs, making sure the trail was safe, letting me know what to look out for, where to step. A couple times, he did go behind me if we thought there might be a bear or something dangerous behind us, just in case. And then I'd run into these moments where I really didn't know how to take my next step forward. Like, he was way ahead of me. I'm trying to figure out where to step next, how to climb up even one more step. I'd be so focused on my situation unsure what to do, I wouldn't even realize that my husband was right next to me until 
he was like holding out his hand in my line of vision. And it would surprise me and I'd say, oh, hi. <laughs> and I would take his hand and he'd help me take whatever that next crazy step was. You are with me. You're right there. Thank you. That's what it's like, that little bit with God. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, the rod and the staff represent God's guidance and protection and help. They are a comfort because with God as your shepherd, you know you can't go off the path. You know that you are safe. You may not know exactly where you're going, but if you start to go off the track, he'll guide you back. If there's danger, he will protect you. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I had always read this part as like a slap in the face to my enemies, but in Dallas Willard's book, he points out that we are to love our enemies and that if God is my shepherd, that feast prepared on the table, the love and goodness of God is probably to be shared with my enemies. It made me think of how Melissa Brownback, the main author of our Full Spectrum study book, described this whole Psalms study like this. The overarching message of Psalms is that with God, every part of you is welcome. Our anxiety and grief, our anger and envy, our thanksgiving and praise all have a place in the life of a person of faith. The more we learn to sit with our emotions, the more our capacity grows to offer support and care to others. As we learn to follow God as our shepherd, as we are able to more and more honestly say, I lack nothing, we grow in our capacity to offer support and care to others, even our enemies. You anoint my head with oil. Now, anointing with oil is a sign of welcome and respect. The word used to say anoint here is not the normal word most places in the Bible use. This is a unique word. Why? Well, it's the word deshanta, which actually means to like fatten, to make bigger, to make healthy. So this anointing is about confidence. It's about growing your imagination, helping you see more possibilities. God is healing your heart and mind, your inner self. And then my cup overflows. It will never run out. God's love will never run out. It is overflowing. Enough for every minute of every day with enough to share. And did you notice Another turn has happened. We began as total sheep, right? We're laying in the grass like animals do. Now we're at a table drinking from cups. As we follow God, we transition from mindless sheep who can't do anything for themselves to starting to partner with God, facing our enemies with confidence and love because of God's love. And then surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God is leading you. God is next to you. God is behind you. There's nothing to fear. You can choose this life. What if just for a day, you, me, we practice living like God is our shepherd? This psalm reflects David's personal relationship with God, and it is within this kind of relationship that a life without lack is known. You can have that kind of relationship in life as fully as it can be imagined. Read this quote from Life Without Lack with me. This psalm reflects the nature of God and how the radiant sufficiency of the shepherd provides the life without lack. God is an ineffable reality, so much greater than anything we ordinarily see around us or come to deal with in human life. He simply has no comparison. We are blessed to live in a world where there is a fully self-sufficient, generous God who wants to provide what is best for us and loves us more than we could ever imagine. So let's imagine and practice this. Let's see what possibilities there could be. What if you were willing to live for one day as if God was your loving, present, powerful shepherd, like Psalm 23 was possible? Would you be willing to try it? Even if it feels weird or you don't totally believe it yet, would you be willing to try? Don't you think it'd be worth it? What do you have to lose? So it doesn't have to be perfect. But we do need a plan for how to live this one day like God is our shepherd. Just like with the four-minute mile, you do not need perfect circumstances for this to be a success. First thing is just choose a day. Like, choose a regular day. Because we're trying to see what it would be like to have God as our shepherd and not lack while living our real lives. So taking care of kids, going to work and school, driving around, getting mad, sad, worried, rebellious, all of it. Then set your mindset. 
we will choose to believe a few fundamental things. God is always present, always loving, always working ahead of you, always with and behind you. Your life is good. You are good. I don't mean comfortable, but good. Deciding that God gave you this day to lead you through it, to love you in it. So just prepare to see the day with gratitude and attention to detail, like the green grass, the quiet waters, the clouds, the way your car sounds when it's running, the way your coffee smells, your best friends laugh. Really use all of your senses to experience the day. And then make a plan. Here's what I do on these days. I schedule two to three times to fully read Psalm 23 throughout the day. And then add a minute of silence before and after just to prepare and listen. It'll take you three minutes total. One minute silence, one minute read, one minute silence. And then look ahead at your day. Notice which parts might be the most difficult. Remind yourself that God will be there with you. Picture yourself there, but not alone. And then also schedule times of rest. Yeah, for real. Little times with no pressure, only gratitude. Remember, he makes you lie down in green pastures. So you got to make yourself lie down. Schedule two to three times of grateful rest. I like to set the timer on my watch for 10 minutes, put on some music, and close my eyes. <laughs> it helps me remember that I'm not the shepherd. And then at the end of your day, take a few minutes to reflect on how much your actions and attitude were changed by believing that God is your shepherd. So you make a plan, and then you just got to work that plan. Work the plan. As you work out, as you take kids to school, you go to work, you run errands, recite. The Lord is my shepherd. Put it in your head. We even made like a little phone lock screen or wallpaper graphic if you want to get it for free at thecrossing.com slash full spectrum. And then every time you notice a sense of lack, just pay attention to what you think you lack. Another word for lack that might come up for you could be worry, unfair, not appreciated, alone, need, want. Just notice them. And then here's a prayer tip. When you notice any lack, say it to God in prayer. That was unfair. She didn't even listen to me. Did you see that guy cut me off? I really want more ice cream. Whatever it is, let God be your empathetic witness. And then if you can, write them down. Don't be afraid of listing them. God already knows what you want, need, feel, think, all of it. But by writing them down, you can make a turn in your prayer life. In that darkest valley, in those moments, you put your eyes on God. You tell Him and yourself what you are experiencing, and then you let empathy be present as He witnesses you. Then let Him refresh your soul. Let Him prepare a table for you to share with others. Rather than repeating our lack as we pray about the worry, we start to transform it into a prayer of promise. Pray that worry as a promise. So what we're doing is we're praying God's promises over our worries. It's that next turn. For example, if you're really worried about making the wrong choice in a big situation in your life, you remember Psalm 23. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Okay, and then we make it a prayer. We say, thank you, Lord, that your word says that you will guide me along the right paths, that I can trust you as my shepherd. Even when it's the hardest, I can let go of fear because you are with me. You are guiding and comforting me. I can rest in your care. Or if you're struggling with a person in your life, remember, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. And then you turn that prayer. You say, Lord, thank you that your word says you are the one who can work between me and this person. You are giving me everything I need to be loving, caring, confident. Thank you for anointing my head, transforming my mind, giving me strength. Thank you for seeing me and giving me more than enough love and care. At home, at work, in the car, in line at the grocery store, spend one day believing it is possible to live as if the Lord is your shepherd. We don't need perfect conditions. We just need to believe it is possible and give it a try. Now, we also have a full study guide to help you learn more about God and yourself through the Psalms. You can get the digital version at thecrossing.com slash full spectrum for free. Share this video 
and that study with a friend today too. Let's pray. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Lord, help us believe it. Help us to live like it is true. You are our shepherd. Give us an imagination to truly believe that we can live a life where there is less and less and less lack and more and more fulfillment and satisfaction and your presence. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God is my shepherd, I won't be wanting, I won't be wanting. He makes me rest in fields of green with quiet streams. of God forever. 